And we are live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the stream. I hope you're all doing well and that you had a, a nice uh, beginning of the week. Uh, my week is starting quite well, I have to say. Uh, I'm very happy to have you uh, back here for another interview uh, with a member of the European Parliament. Uh, tonight, we will discuss uh, with uh, MEP Morten Peterson from the political group Renew Europe, so on the, on the center of EU politics, so to say. Uh, he is uh, 55 years old and he has been a Danish MEP since 2014, so it's, it's uh, his second mandate. Uh, he is currently one of the vice chairs of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, and he is a substitute member in the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Uh, but as usual, before we start the conversation, uh, a quick reminder of the house rules for anyone who is new with us tonight. So I guess will be with us for about an hour. After that, he will be uh, able to go enjoy the rest of his evening. And you will be stuck with me for another half an hour. Where I will be debriefing the interview, uh, sharing any additional explanations that are required, answer your question, that sort of thing. As usual, I have prepared my own questions uh, for the interview. Uh, and I also collected a question from people on Reddit, Discord, and Twitter. Actually, I had a lot of very interesting question uh, for, for, for tonight, so I had to make tough choices uh, for, for, for the questions. But uh, in any case, you can also ask your own questions uh, via the chat. Uh, I will keep an eye on it uh, and pick among your suggestions, of course. So feel free to participate and to react. But as always, don't spam and stay civil. So the goal of these uh, interviews uh, is for you to understand better what's the job, what is the job of an MEP. Uh, in this case, who is Mr. Uh, Mr. Peterson? What are his priorities? Uh, what is he working on? What are, his, are some of his opinions on the EU in general? Uh, so tonight uh, we're having a, a Renew MEP uh, and we had a few weeks ago people from uh, the left, from the Greens, uh, we had EPP MEP, MEP. So we, have, we try to have people from all across the political spectrum uh, so that you can see this diversity and forge your own uh, opinion. And, in the end, it doesn't matter if you agree or not with uh, what Mr. Peterson or what, with what other uh, guests do. It's about uh, broadening your horizon and discovering the EU. Um, also, we will not do, go deep into policy discussion and we will not touch on uh, national politics unless it's uh, relevant to EU politics. So keep that in mind uh, when you're asking your question. Uh, so uh, with this said, I suggest that we can start. And good evening, Mr. Peterson. Thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, I hope you are doing well. Um, and thanks again for, for, for coming. Um, so perhaps to, to, to kick uh, off this, uh, the, this interview, uh, could you briefly introduce yourself to the audience? Please? Sure. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I've been looking forward to, uh, to, to this. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great format and um, I'm, I'm looking forward. So, yes, I, I'm uh, Morten Hilvig Peterson. I have a complicated uh, middle name in, in, in Danish. Uh, uh, also, uh, I, I, uh, as you said, I'm 55 years old. I'm, I'm working a lot on, on climate and energy issues, which I, I find to uh, or believe are, are, are the most pressing and most important ones. So uh, this is what really... Uh, makes me motivated to uh, to to be uh, an MEP and and working on this extremely important uh, agenda. So this is uh, my main focus in European Parliament, and I've had the privilege of working with this uh, over the last uh, seven years. And looking very much forward to the next couple of years because it's such a critical phase that we are in in terms of of climate and and energy issues. So uh, that is extremely exciting and 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 an important topic. Yeah, yeah. And and what, uh, since you you mentioned that you specialize on energy, what what brought you to energy? What did you decide? Oh, I'm going to work on energy policy. So, um, I, 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 for, for me personally, uh, and, and, and with that, what I've been doing in, in Danish politics and in the private sector previously to, to becoming an MEP, I, I didn't do energy or climate issues. So, uh, that was actually a, a deliberate choice when, when being elected first time around in, in 2014. And, and I guess the main reason for this being simply that, that it, it just dawned on me how important this is. And, and I'm fully aware that this climate discussion has been going on for, for, for decades. So it's, it's not a new thing, unfortunately. But for me personally, uh, it, w it was new to me. Uh, and and uh, it really made an impression on me how serious this is and, and how fast we have to move in order to combat climate change. So that was an eye opener for me personally, leading to uh, my motivation uh, in, in order to, to work on these uh, issues. 
And so, so like you, you mentioned, uh, we're talking a lot about energy these days, uh, whether it's with the, the COP26, but also more recently, well, COP26 is current, but before that, we've been talking about energy because there's been a, a big increase in the, in the prices of natural gas. It's created a lot of debates at, the, at EU level. Uh, and there's been actually debates between member states on why the, there is a problem with the natural gas prices. Uh, some say that it's purely temporary, others are saying that there is a structural problem with the way the, the, the energy market in the EU is, uh, is structured. So what's, what's your, your, your take on this? Are we in something that will calm down in a, in a few months or is there a more structural problem? So th there is definitely a structural problem, but, but, but that is that we simply have not built out and rolled out renewables to the extent that we ought to have been doing already. So we have a, a very critical short-term issue, which I, I fully acknowledge, and it is so sensitive, given um, and the reactions from, from all over Europe, from citizens being um, worried about the energy prices and, and, and for good reason. But uh, it is, in my opinion, a, a short-term phenomenon that we have to address. But the long-term issue and the structural issue is, simply put, that that we have to much much we have to move much faster than what we managed to uh, to do so far. So, um, and, and I think we have a tremendous challenge in Europe, and not, not to say globally, uh, in order to build out with renewables uh, in the pace and to the extent that we ought to do. And and simply put, if we do not succeed in this, then we're not succeeding in in fulfilling our, our climate uh, objectives and ambitions. So, short term issues, yes, they are serious. But the long-term solution to this is simply to uh, to move faster in terms of rolling out renewables. And, and uh, like, like you mentioned, so the, the what's at stake is the, the, the changing, or at least the evolution of the energy mix in, in Europe, so that there is more and more uh, renewable energies being used to, to generate electricity. Uh, and one of the debate, another debate that is uh, occurring currently at EU level is about what we call the transition energy. So to bridge the gap between that more the current state where we are relying a lot on energy, on fossil fuels and to the point where we are re relying more on, on renewable. And there are there is a debate about whether uh, ga natural gas and, and nuclear energy should be considered, uh, included what is called at, in Brussels the, the, the green taxonomy. So basically the, a kind of label that, uh, that uh, is given to, to transitional green energy. So what do you think about, about these? Should they be including the considered as uh, transition energies or should they be banned, so to say, in a way? I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of including this in, in the taxonomy. Again, uh, given that the taxonomy is, is basically trying to define and say, okay, what do we consider to be? Green, uh, green, green, green technologies and, and what to base our, our future systems on. And I fully acknowledge all the difficulties in the transition that we will need some sort of, of gas, say, in terms of, of bridging technologies, of ensuring stability in our energy systems. But we have to limit this to the shortest possible uh, number of, of years. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan. I would much prefer that we focus on build out of renewables, which by the way, uh, and, and I think this is extremely exciting. Over the last five, 10 years, we've seen such a drop in prices in renewables that if you are to go out and invest now and build new greenfield uh, energy plans and, 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 and energy uh, systems, then renewables would be the cheapest uh, source of, of, of energy. And this is why I think it's important that we, we keep focus on, on this. So I'm not a big fan of, of, of including this in the taxonomy. And, and I think we, we will have a, a very big and, and sensitive discussion, which we already have, mm -hmm. between member states uh, on, uh, on this. And it's also very easy to see some sort of, of sh uh, shadow deal being struck here with countries with gas and countries with nuclear agreeing on, on on creating majorities in order to include it in the taxonomy. So it might very well end there, but I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, simply put, because renewables are, are by now the cheapest source of energy. So why not focus on on, on this? So that would be my approach to uh, to this discussion. Okay. Uh, and, and speaking of renewables, uh, another like point that comes, uh, com that comes often when we're talking about uh, renewables is the idea that since uh, when we're talking about windmills, when we're talking about solar energy, they are 
impermanent source of energy. You can't, uh, you can't have always wind, you, can't, you don't have always sun. So there is always this idea that uh, uh, either you need a backup source of energy, which is going to be more reliable, so that's where you, go, you put back the, uh, you call back to the natural gas, the nuclear, the fossil fuel, or the idea of uh, large-scale stor energy storage system. So how do you think, uh, should it be both, should it be one over the other? So... I'll, I'll oh which. yeah, uh, well, well, well. Again, uh, I, I, I think that there, there is uh, some need for, for for gas in in a short period. The issue is to minimize this this period in order to ensure that we basically phase out fossil fuels as soon as possible. Because uh, this is where the problem is: uh, our further use of fossils. We have to to we have to focus hard on on phasing this out. But but you're absolutely right. Given that renewables are intermittent in in in, in characteristics, uh, we need storage. Uh, we need to uh, also further invest and research in in in, in ways of utilizing uh, all this green electricity coming from, say, offshore wind farms or, or solar uh, installations uh, on land or, or what have you. So, all these exciting discussions on power to X and how to use. Uh, electricity in order to generate fuels, my planes, it might be trucks, buses, hydrogen, uh, uh, district heating. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of applications where where we will have use for uh, for green electricity. So it's a wide, wide field of applications where you can use all this, all these renewables uh, being generated uh, offshore or onshore or, or what have you. But for sure, storage batteries. Uh, all these discussions are, are sensitive and critical, and we have to develop solutions on, in these fields uh, in order to in order to utilize all this electricity that we hopefully will uh, will generate. And uh, since we're talking about about uh, batteries and and, and storage, uh, there there is also this idea sometimes that we would be trading one uh, dependency for another for another. Like for now, for now we. Are, we are relying uh, to an extent on on Russian gas, and if we switch to to solar and into a battery will be relying on certain material that for instance mostly are producing in china yeah, because they are very specific uh, materials so uh, aren't we like the uh, aren't we like trading uh, a devil for another well i i think that there's a lot of of of, of uh, very many interesting perspectives on 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 these discussions of of sovereignty and european autonomy because i, I think it's dawning on on all of us that that I mean, uh, as you allude to, being dependent on Russia and, and China is not necessarily a good thing for, for us Europeans. So we have to be more conscious about how we ensure stability of supply, how we ensure autonomy, uh, how we ensure that, that the, the European industries still can source and get the inputs they need for their production of whatever commodity or product or, or, or be it service that they that they provide. So I, I think I think there's many eye openers in, in in these discussions these years, and also realizing that we cannot and should not be totally dependent on say Putin or uh, the sheiks in the Middle East on on oil or for that sake China in terms of processing of of rare earth uh, minerals or or or, or other. Uh, critical components to uh, to this. Uh, in many ways, I, I think this green deal, this notion of European, European, uh, sorry, Europe in in a green transition, is a wake up call for all of us. And we've been sleeping for many years, and now we have to uh, to face up and, and 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 wake up to some really tough issues and tough facts out there. Well, some of us have been thinking, thinking much more strategically and much more long term than we've had a tradition for doing in, in Europe. So I, I think there's a lot to be uh, learned from these lessons. And I, I think it's time to wake up with Charles is by now. But but it's difficult, obviously, and, and a lot of work to, to be done on these agendas. Yeah, you, you mentioned the idea that uh, Europe is, is waking up to, to, to an extent to, to the idea. And... The sudden waking up of, of Europe puts to an extent uh, the, the, the EU leaders and everyone in front of a, of a complex situation, like I mentioned, because on the one end, there is the need to, to act quick and act uh, strong to, 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 in order to counter climate change. And on the other end, that's something that we saw 
rising uh, in, in number of member states. So I'm French. I saw that with a yellow jacket. Uh, we saw that uh, rising in, in Spain lately. The idea that to, to make climate change accept, uh, socially acceptable for, for, for people, especially people from, uh, from a poor background. So how do, how do you think we should square this, uh, the, this, uh, this situation? So, uh, this is this is so difficult and so sensitive and and uh, also uh, I mean bearing in mind the discussions over the last month or so with the spike in energy prices to all Europe all over Europe and and the very varying responses that that member states have come up with on this and and clearly I mean that there's no one size fits all solutions to this because given traditions and, and culture and history in each of the member states they would address and approach this in a very differing way so i i do not believe in say top-down solutions coming from brussels that would fit each and every member state because there are so big differences in terms of energy mix in terms of social policies in terms of traditions of coping with uh, challenges uh, in, in in this field so i, I think member states have, have a lot of, of of responsibility in how to address this, be it through social policies or, or, or taxation or, or redistribution or what have you. But I think what we can and should do uh, on a European level is coming back to this issue of uh, autonomy. I, mean, I think there's a fair, uh, a fair argument to be made in terms of further, say, pooling or sharing of resources when, when buying from uh, foreign suppliers. So rather than having Putin squeeze us with, with his prices on natural gas, we should go together and collective bargain in order to ensure that we get a uh, decent treatment, basically. So so that is a very short-term uh, issue. But the long-term issue, and I'm, com I'm coming back to this, is simply put that Europe could and should have more autonomy in these issues by rolling out renewables much faster than what we've managed to do. Because if we manage to do this, we produce our energy in Europe. If we increase our energy efficiency and become even better in saving energy, energy efficiency first principle is absolutely critical to this. Then we do not need to import all this gas from Putin or oil from the sheiks in, in the Middle East or being dependent on, on, on anybody. And, and, and an extremely thrilling perspective in this Green Deal, say the geopolitical uh, ramifications of what we are trying to do. I, I think they're quite underestimated in terms of the impact this will have on countries surrounding Europe, Middle East, Putin and, 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 and other uh, uh, governments uh, all around the globe, so to speak. And speaking of Putin uh, and, and also dependency, so uh what what do you think about the, the the no i mean i can anticipate a bit your what you're gonna answer but where do you stand on the on the Nord stream 2 so the Nord stream 2 is the pipeline that we are, that is between russia and germany so there is this idea that uh, with this project germany is hooking us up the, to 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 uh, increasing uh is increasing our, our dependency on russia on russian gas but also is in a way uh screwing over uh, ukraine uh because at the moment the gas goes through ukraine and that's uh because it, it, it's feeding Europe. Russia is less uh, uh, keen on being aggressive towards Ukraine in order to not piss off Europe. So wh wh what do you think about the situation? Uh, uh, and, and, and Nord Stream 2 is and has been an extremely sensitive discussion in my country, Denmark, because bear in mind that this pipeline comes from, you know, St. Petersburg and goes all the way through the Baltic Sea down to Germany. Just uh, sneaking around this Danish island of, of Bonholm, which is called in the middle of the Baltic Sea. So for us in Denmark, this has been a very, very sensitive discussion uh, as well. And and uh, I think the, the, the answer to this is obviously, again, that, that we try to unite in Europe in terms of, and, and uh, I negotiated the, this gas directive, which is extremely important in, in addressing Nord Stream 2 issues, because basically what we're doing is that we are taking the rules that we know as of today when trading gas in Europe and we expand and extend cover pipelines in and out of, of Europe coming in and out, which is Nord Stream 2. Why? Because we do not want Putin to be able to just on his own sit. And, and dictate prices and thereby using gas as a weapon, which he did in Ukraine. So the only answer to this is to go together in Europe, in the EU, in order to ensure 
that we have some fair competition rules, we have unbundling, we have transparency, we have a lot of strict requirements that even Putin would have to live up to if he is to sell uh, his gas on, on the European market. So I'm not a fan of Nord Stream 2. I've been critical and vocal uh, against this because I, I think it creates a dependency on Putin that I do not like. But this is a reality and will be a reality. And given this, it is extremely important that we have a set of binding rules that even Putin would have to comply with. So Europe is not taken hostage uh, as such by, by him when he's using gas as, as a weapon. And again, what is the long-term solution or answer to all this? Again, let's be independent in Europe by rolling out renewables that we produce locally, Let's ensure that we be, become even better in terms of energy efficiency, thereby not needing to import as much as we've been used to do. So I think there are some very interesting and serious to uh, these uh, short-term uh, issues. Uh, I have a couple of questions that, uh, that comes from the chat. So first, uh, I have a question from someone who is living in Ireland, uh, and he's asking whether a smaller member state like Ireland, Denmark, or Finland would be able to switch to renewable energy faster or if it, there is a, a problem of legislation or, and laws beyond that? Um, yes, uh, member states can, can move much faster on their own if they want to. Uh, but I think also that, that, that we, we move into a world whereby, uh, I mean, the, the old days are gone in terms of member states sitting and just planning and executing on their own without having a look at what the neighbor is doing uh, because if 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 we do more sort of joint planning more really real and true collaboration cross border uh, then we can increase uh, the stability in our systems and we can increase our independency say from import from abroad so yes member states can 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 pick up speed can do stuff faster than what is envisaged within the EU uh, Green Deal. But I think uh, this is so important that we do it jointly in order to maximize uh, all the benefits from doing things uh, together. Uh, so we need a much more integrated system. I think one of the, uh, the mind-blowing things here is that, that we do not have an internal market in energy. Uh, and actually this corporation was based on coal and, and steel originally back in, in the 40s and 50s in the aftermath of, of World War II. Uh, so energy and access to energy was and still is considered to be very much a member state prerogative. But the future lies in even further co collaboration, joint planning, and thereby maximizing the benefits for, for Europeans if we go together. Uh, then I, uh, I will have a, a follow-up question on that, but first I want to, to cover the, the, the second question coming from the chat, who is about new, uh, which is about nuclear energy. So you covered renewable quite, uh, quite extensively, uh, but the person is asking, what, do, what are your views on nuclear energy? So you, you know that in France, France is quite dependent on it. 70% huh? sure. of, uh, of, of French energy is produced with nuclear. So you think nuclear is too much of a risk, uh, or is nuclear energy just delaying the problem? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite pragmatic on this, actually, and, and uh, I fully acknowledge that countries that ha have nuclear running as of today uh, will want to uh, maintain this and keep uh, nuclear in, in their energy mix. So, you know, that, that's, uh, that's, you know, I'm quite pragmatic on this. On this. Uh, what, what I'd like to see from the pro-nuclear uh, side of, of, of the argument is simply put uh, show me some cases and examples of new nuclear projects that have not gone absolutely bananas in terms of, of costs and delays. I don't see it. Uh, I, when I talk to people about the Hinkley Point in the UK or, or the Finnish example, uh, uh, the only story I hear is about delays and cost overruns. And if you can show me the opposite, uh, I'd be very curious and, and open to all kinds of discussions, but but I don't see it. Uh, so if anybody sees it and 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 and, and can lead the way or, or pave the way in this, I'm, I'm I would be curious, but I just don't see it. Coming back to the point that with the drop in prices in renewables, I just don't see new nuclear plants having a chance in terms of competing, basically on uh, basically in, in, in the terms of of prices. But if there are other experiences out there, I'm I'd be very curious and I'm happy to learn. And 
So uh, you, you uh, I'm going back to my follow-up question to, to your answer. Um, you, you just mentioned that there is no, in fact, Euro European market of energy. Yeah, there's no single market of energy. So then can you maybe explain a bit to the audience how then the what we call the energy market is working currently uh, and what kind of then European policy is there? So uh, my, my, my point is that when you look at a European map, and you see what's happening in terms of cross-border exchange of, of electricity. Uh, I think half of the existing capacity is in use today. So say, uh, for the sake of the argument, you have a border between two countries and you have a motorway, a highway with four lanes, then on average, you'll only be using two lanes. I mean, this is in the big picture what's happening in, in Europe today. We are simply put not good enough in terms of cross-border exchange of, of, of energy because and, and that is too bad because the vision the vision ought to be that when the wind is blowing in the black sea or in the north sea or when the sun is shining and all the big solar installations in spain or france or, or wherever uh, when, when you really have strong push in, in production of renewable energy then obviously you should be able to to store it use it but also exchange it cross-border in order to further optimize this notion of, of, of joint planning. And, and this, we have simply not been good enough at in doing yet. And this is why we do not have an internal market in electricity. We have it in gas. But we do that blocking us in terms of doing progress on this green transition, where we simply need to integrate renewables further in our energy systems again in order to combat climate change in order to phase out coal in order to phase out oil in order to phase out fossils and thereby ensuring that we reach our our visions and and, and climate objectives so um, and and there we could and i'm i'm thinking of the, the, there was a report from the international energy agency coming out before summer that was quite explicit in saying that we need more international collaboration cross-border uh, if we are to fulfill our climate targets. And I think Europe is, is really a case in point because if we are not capable of doing this in Europe, when, where on earth uh, would, you, would you see uh, uh, people succeeding in this? So I think it's a big problem. I also think it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for, for Europe at large in order to to ensure that improve in this cross-border exchange of electricity, which we are not very good at uh, as of today. And so one last question maybe on, on, on energy before we move on to the, uh, to the other uh, sure. topics. Uh, this week we're having the COP26. Uh, so the, 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 the international summit to try to deal with, uh, with climate change. Uh, what is your, your opinion on the situation? Are you optimistic about it? Uh, are you, what are you expecting from there? So I, I was in, in uh, at the COP in uh, in Madrid two years ago, and and that was a very sad experience because um, basically nothing happened. Um, the Americans were out of the Paris Agreement at that point in time. You had the Chinese and and the Indians not wanting to to do much or, or moving uh, much on anything. So nothing, not not much was was actually happening, um, and it was very clear for me to see that if, if someone were going to lead these uh, processes, then, then Europe would have to play a, a really big role. Europe would have to step up in terms of ambitions and, and leadership. That was a very, very clear experience from, from Madrid. And I think the good news this time around is that, that with Biden and the new American administration, you, you, you at least have some ideas and notions of, of, of climate and energy, again, being back at the forefront in order to combat climate change. But still, I mean, the deliveries uh, don't seem very promising so far. Also, the notion of, of China and India not even coming to the, the COP uh, and, and, and realizing that China is, is like a quarter of all emissions uh, that we produce globally as of today, and, and China and India not stepping up is bad news. Uh, Russia, Turkey, uh, more or less the same thing. So uh, in many ways, uh, we, we have a very, very difficult situation where I think Europe really has to step up and, and, and show the way, pave the way uh, for other, uh, other continents to, uh, to follow uh, suit. And, 
and if you just allow me just just a minute on 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 the green deal because if we succeed uh in 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 legislating and and passing this green deal where the commission has proposed uh, uh i think it's 3800 pages of legislation it is massive it is the biggest project perhaps in the history of of the european Union, but if we succeed in this, and it's going to be very difficult given sensitivities in this issue, Europe will be the continent on the face of Earth that would have the most encompassing uh, framework uh, of, of of laws of of regulations, basically ensuring this green transition. So it is a, a, a I really like the vision, and I fully acknowledge that it's going to be so hard, so much bloody hard work in order to ensure that we actually adopt this because uh, you still have a lot of uh, member states that are not that progressive or or, uh, or, or need to be uh, pushed or nudged in, in the right direction. But the vision is fantastic. I'm a big fan of this and, and we'll work hard to see it come through. And but like you mentioned, Europe, I mean, even if what it's currently doing is insufficient, uh, clearly, uh, given the, the scale of the, of, of, in the risk of, of climate change, uh, Europe is definitely the continent that is doing already the most and will likely be doing the most to, uh, to fight climate change. But then on the other end, and like you mentioned, we have countries like uh, like China, like India, like Russia, who in a way refuse to pitch in. I mean, like you you, you mentioned, uh, China and Russia didn't even bother to uh, uh, to come to the COP26. COP so how do we uh, do we get, especially China, which is a quarter of the uh, of the emission, how do we get them to... Uh, to actually commit to do something, because otherwise Europe can do whatever it wants, but without China, isn't it a bit meaningless? Right, and and uh, and uh, for sure that that is uh, extremely difficult and, and 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 difficult to do. Uh, I, I, I think, I, I, but I think also that that what we're seeing and hopefully will see is sort of a new consciousness about. I mean, what what we do in Europe and what we can do in Europe, and and this is where this this concept of of, of CPAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, comes into play. Because basically, if we lift our ambitions in Europe in order to uh, transit away from fossils, then of course it doesn't make much sense. Which we then, on the other hand, if we then, on the other hand, just import uh, basically the same stuff from China or other places. Uh, which would then produce uh, in a much more polluting way than what we've been achieving in Europe. So we, we need this concept of a carbon border adjustment mechanism in order to ensure a level playing field. And, and uh, I know this is going to be very tough and difficult to do, but I think the concept is, is right, thereby ensuring that if we increase our ambitions in Europe, we, do, we, we don't just see flagging out of European jobs. No, we would also have to impose this carbon border adjustment mechanism on imports from, from China. And that could or should hopefully also pave the way for the Chinese to, uh, to wake up to this. Because uh, I think we also have to have a very frank discussion with, with, with the Chinese and, uh, in this. And, and of course, they, they are smart people. They, they know that climate change is affecting China uh, every bit as much as it is affecting all of us. So they have an own interest in this. It's not only a thing that is, you know, a European thing. Of course, China have and should have a big motivation and incentive to combat climate change. But, but this will be very tough uh, negotiations and discussions with the Chinese and with the Americans or, or Indians for, for, for that matter. So uh, uh, all this to say that I, I think this notion of the carbon border adjustment mechanism is a right idea. Uh, hopefully, we could get to talk to the Chinese, to the Indians, to Americans, and hopefully, in the best of all worlds, agree on some sort of, of say, uh, global ETS, global uh, carbon uh, mechanism uh, scheme where we'll agree on some of these uh, concepts. I know it's it's a far stretch, but but I, I hope this is where it will take us with, with these discussions, because uh, if not, again, we, w we won't succeed in, in combating climate change and all stands to lose, also the Chinese, if, mm. if this were to happen. Of course. Um, moving on from energy, but to something a bit related, you mentioned at the, at the beginning that to, to succeed in, in fighting climate change, we'll need a lot of research. Uh, and 
well, you, you're vice chair of, uh, of uh, the ITRE committee and you're in charge of means of the uh, research, EU research program, Horizon Europe. Uh, so I had a couple of questions on that. Uh, first, what, what's do you, what do you think about the, the, the evolution of the Horizon, Horizon program, so the EU research program? Uh, is it going in the right direction? And do you think the EU is investing enough in, uh, in fundamental research, or long-term research? So, um, um, I, I think the EU research programs in general are, are perhaps one of the greatest successes of, of, of the EU cooperation. Um, I think in terms of education, the Erasmus programs are, are, are fantastic. Uh, young people are benefiting from these programs uh, every day. And the same applies to, to our research programs, uh, which are in scale, I mean, so big, so huge uh, that that you know other continents would would envy us uh, in this. So I think there's a lot of very many very good things to be said about our our research uh, programs. But clearly, uh, I mean, one thing is is this financial discussion and on whether we invest enough. And I think the very basic answer to this is you can hardly ever invest enough in in, in research and and. And uh, and my worry would be, for example, in the terms in the field of renewables, that Europe is leading in in, in clean tech, in green clean tech, in terms of patents. But with the Chinese ambitions of, of being number one in this as well, will Europe be able to maintain its competitive advantage in these fields? I'm not sure. Which is why we need to invest in research, also in these fields, but also uh, more broadly. I'm, I'm a big fan of 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 prioritizing basic research because I, I think that. Within uh, research and, and, and development, uh, we, we, we constantly uh, keep being surprised by what basic research can, can lead to. And, and the very na basic nature of basic e research is exactly that it, it is unpredictable. And uh, it can lead to astonishing innovations and, and, and uh, without being able to predict beforehand okay so what's coming out of this so i'm i'm, I'm a very big fan of, of basic research uh, and i think we have to take care that we do not dilute our research programs in terms of having too many very focused priorities and still have a big chunk out there for basic research because at the end of the day i think that is what drives a lot of of, of innovation uh, in, in in europe at least and uh, one of the current debate about the uh Eurasian Europe uh, program is uh, related to uh, the UK and Switzerland, which for now are kept at the at bay of the program. So they used to be uh, to be able to participate to the program, but then uh, came Brexit, then came uh, other problems with Switzerland, and they are kept at bay of the program ever since. So uh, in the case of the UK, there is a, sub a suspicion that uh, uh, their participation to the program is is being withheld uh, because of the problem with the Northern, Northern Ireland. So it's a bit of a, of a tit for tat kind of approach. And in the case of Switzerland, there apparently there is a there is problem of contribution of Switzerland to the EU cohesion fund. So, do, do you think it is proportionate to an extent to, to leverage the participation of third country to Eurasian Europe because, with other political consideration, whether it's Brexit, whether it's whatever uh, problem? In short, uh, yes, I, I think it's it's fair uh, without you know, re resolving to or, or without going into. Uh, minor and petty uh, tit for tat stuff, but but in in you know with the, in in the big picture, I fair and fine for for EU to say, okay, guys, if 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 you want to do research with us or you you want to do cooperation with us, we have to ensure that we have some sort of level playing field on on the various issues. So in the big picture, yes, I, I think it's fair enough because we also have to avoid scenarios where which the brits are trying to do uh, in my opinion uh, to to sort of uh, divide and rule and and and, and cherry pick uh, whatever kind of initiatives or or actions they they they, they like and then stay out of, of of what they 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 do not like so again in in the very big picture i i think to a large extent it's it is fair enough uh, of course we have to look out for it's not uh, escalating into uh, petty uh, tit for tat stuff, but in the big picture, yes, uh, it's fair enough. And isn't it? Uh, how, how do you explain that with uh, to, 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 science, to, to the scientific community? Because this morning I was reading actually an, an article, but from the the new president of the uh, of the uh, ERC, so the uh, 
uh, European Research Committee was saying that, well, actually, the, the UK and Switzerland should be brought back into Eurasian Europe because uh, research is universal. We all gain, uh, stand to gain from that, etc., etc. I, mean, I, I fully understand and, and acknowledge uh, the point, and, and I fully acknowledge that that you have projects out there where you have researchers working together on a daily basis with with colleagues in in, in UK or in Switzerland that that stand to uh, uh, be harmed from if any cooperation was was not carried through. So I, I fully understand the worry, but on the other hand. I, my conclusion would be to, uh, or, or, or would be to, say to the Swiss or, or the Brits uh, that that okay, but but you guys you, you stand to benefit and probably even more than the European side. So uh, come on, uh, let, let's agree on stuff. Uh, so again, I'm coming back to I, I think that there should be a level playing field, but I I fully acknowledge and understand the frustration by by researchers that are cooperating on a on a daily basis. Um, another question, uh, staying aside research, but another topic that is relevant to, to ITRE committee is the question of the 5G technology, which has been a big debate over the past few, year, few years, mm -hmm. and there is a push to try to develop a, a European infrastructure for, for 5G, uh, especially in competition with foreign entities, especially whether Chinese with Huawei, uh, uh, Korean with Samsung, etc., etc., etc. So do you think it's... Uh, uh, it is a, a good approach that you prioritize uh, European-made infrastructure, or is it like protectionism, uh, so to say? Well, it's it's a fine line. Um, if it's uh, protectionism or or uh, or, or, or uh, autonomy a desire yeah. for autonomy for uh, sovereignty or, or whatever you call it, but I think in many ways we've been too naive. In, in, in dealing with uh, with China, I'm sorry to say, in terms of, of trade issues, trade policies, in terms of state aid, in terms of enforcing IPR, uh, I think that there are a lot of, of issues where where we have believed, myself included, that by opening up our markets, we would eventually politically align sort of our systems or our models. But that is clearly not happening. And, and this has not happened over the last or whatever and and i think the same applies to 5g and and the telco issues um so i'm i'm you know not in favor i'm not arguing in favor of of uh, europe uh, developing from scratch its own systems and trying to build something which would not be competitive enough but but i, I think it's fair to say that there are issues out there that we have to take very seriously in, in, in telco issues and, and 5G, well, the, the, the issue of, of, of having suppliers uh, from, from uh, outside of Europe that might be too close to uh, their own governments and exploiting, say, data or, or, or critical infrastructure in, 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 in their own uh, benefits. I think we have to look out for this and, and see how we can safeguard it. So um, I think it's fair to, to have more requirements in there. Uh, more safeguards in order to ensure that if it is about, uh, say, 5G or, or the other uh, telco activities, that, that there are no backdoors that we do not know of, <laughs> to put it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, in order to ensure that we have some autonomy and sovereignty and at least know what's going on. All right. Um, this time, completely moving on from uh, from ITRE. And one small question on, on one other thing that you're doing that I didn't mention in the introduction. Uh, is that you're a member of the uh, uh, delegation to EU-Turkey Joint Parliamentary Committee. So the, uh, the, 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 dele the delegation between the EU Parliament and the Turkish Parliament. And so I had a question, given, well, your likely expertise on EU-Turkey relationship, there is the obvious question about Turkey's application to the EU. Uh, things that no have not been going smoothly in that, on that front lately. So do you think, what, what do you think of the situation? Should the EU ultimately accept Turkey uh, in the EU? No, uh, and and clearly this is not the time uh, to to do so. And and I think that what what's happening in Turkey is is uh, is is really sad in so many ways because Erdogan is is uh, is, is really uh, striking down hard on on, uh, on on opponents, on media, on some of the very basic civil rights that we'd like to uphold within the EU, even though we have uh, obviously our own issues and difficulties with what's going on in Poland and, 
and Hungary and, and other member states. But clearly, uh, this notion of membership uh, for, for, for Turkey is is not high on the agenda, if on the agenda at all. Uh, and I'm, I'm critical of what's going on in Turkey. Uh, and, and I don't see how on earth we could, you know, uh, negotiate in, in seriousness right now, given what, what's going on there, which is, a, in my opinion, a very sad development. Um, I, I was hoping for seeing more alignment and say, uh, uh, you know, a, a smoother process whereby you could have the prospect of of visa reciprocity, of, of further trade liberalization, what have you, uh, in, 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 in actual real negotiations on, on some of the chapters. But this is clearly not uh, the time now for, for this, unfortunately. And, and you think that is, uh, so you mentioned the problem with, uh, with Erdogan, so the, uh, the ruler of, of Turkey, but do you think it's all, the problems are only related to, to Erdogan? So the, the Turkey could join the EU if at some point a uh, new, uh, new head of Turkey becomes reasonable, or is it altogether as a principle Turkey should not be in the EU? No, no, I, I think it's, it's mainly linked, in my opinion, to, to, to Erdogan. No one knows, obviously, who will follow after Erdogan, but, but uh, I, I, I think if uh, in, in, a, um, in, a, in a scenario, in a, in a futuristic uh, scenario, hypothetical scenario, if, if you had you know, a, a movement in Turkey Uh, uh, that would emphasize and encourage you know, civil liberties and 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 uh, and breaking out of some of these very very bad things that Erdogan are doing. Then then you could have a hypothetical situation with a new administration coming in that actually wanted to uh, be serious about this. And then I think you should, from the EU side, seriously consider, uh, say, uh, having some sort of 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 track for future negotiations but but this is i'm afraid uh, a long time out in, in the time horizon okay uh now let's talk about uh denmark actually uh so something uh, i i learned actually today when i was uh, collecting questions on reddit i learned that uh, a few years ago uh, the danish supreme court uh ruled that the, the danish constitution had primacy of eu law uh on on a number of matters uh The, the answer, the, it's a bit more complicated than that, I know. I, I can see at your face that you don't necessarily agree. <laughs> but that, that's my way to segue it in the, this into the debate about uh, the, the, the Polish rule of law, which at its own mm -hmm. Supreme Court that's very clearly uh, questioned the primacy of EU law. So what's your opinion on this, on this uh, old debate, uh, especially in the, Danish, uh, in the Danish context? So um, uh, uh, it is. It is acknowledged, uh, obviously, that EU law uh, is is, uh, uh, is superior uh, in, in, in in Denmark, and and if not, then we would not have you know the the, the internal market or, or, or uh, important nation that would function. And bear in mind that Denmark is a small, open economy. We're totally dependent. On being able to produce and export to uh, our, our good friends all over Europe in, in the internal market, so we are heavily dependent on this. And you have numerous studies showing uh, what, what the benefits are for the average households in Denmark uh, having the the opportunity or the possibility of of our uh, export companies exporting to uh, to the rest of, of of Europe. And this all requires the primacy of EU law in, in, in many areas. What what we have in Denmark, and, and, and a very peculiar situation in Denmark, is that we have these opt-outs that, that you might exactly, have. Exactly, yes. I was going um, to talk about that. So, so we, we have in, in some very specific areas, we have opt-outs. Now, uh, as, as you know, we had the no uh, to the referendum back in 92. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in order to avoid Denmark, totally slipping out of the EU, uh, there was a, a national compromise struck and we eventually managed to get an agreement uh, with the EU Commission and, and the other member states that Denmark would be in the EU, but with these four opt-outs. And, and one of the opt-outs is, is European citizenship, which is no longer uh, relevant. But then we have an opt-out uh, from the euro We, we, we are not a euro country. We do not participate in 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 in, in euro 
related uh, areas. So, so that is the second of our opt-out. We have an opt-out on defense and foreign affairs. Uh, so we would not uh, participate in, in joint initiatives, EU initiatives on, on, on security and defense issues. And then we have an opt-out on home and legal affairs. Um, uh, so uh, if, if you ha- uh, say, well, one of the things that I negotiated in the previous terms was, was an association agreement that we have to strike with Europol, uh, the European uh, police uh, uh, agency in, in, in The Hague. Uh, and, and the very, very important issue of, of access to databases, which is a, uh, an extremely important tool uh, for Danish police as well as police all over Europe in order to uh, look for suspects or, or patterns in, in, in the Schengen information system and, and other uh, databases. So we, we have a scheme, we have a parallel agreement where we get some sort of access, but we are not a full member. So uh, we have these opt-outs with the three opt-outs as of today on foreign affairs and security, uh, on legal home affairs and, and the euro. And, and in all areas, uh, I see uh, developments within the EU uh, where you're looking for strengthening further the cooperation, which Denmark basically will not be part of, part of given our opt-out, which I find problematic, but I'm in a minority in my, in my <laughs> country. We've had, we've had referendas uh, since the big uh, votes in 92 and 93, and and we've lost them all. So and, <laughs> I'm the wrong guy to ask. I've been in favor of getting rid of these opt-outs, and I've lost each and every time. So and, and they, <laughs> maybe can, can you explain why why are these opt-outs considered important for, for Danish people? I mean, what what is it that they don't? Why do they don't want the euro? Why don't they don't they want uh, uh, home affairs and, and uh, EU policy? So what's the reason oh, behind that? In many ways, I mean, you, you, you're somewhat parallel to the discussions you've had in the UK on Brexit. That that uh, it's important for or has been important for uh, half of the uh, of the electorate, or, or a bit more than half. Uh, that that uh, this notion of sovereignty, whatever sovereignty is, uh, but but this has been a very important uh, uh, factor in 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 all the various referendums we've been having uh, and, and all the debates that we've having. That the the Proponents of 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 of, uh, of of the opt out saying basically yeah that that we have more influence we have more sovereignty by having these opt outs but uh, and and I would totally disagree saying that well we influence more by being in there within the corporation rather than being uh, out of, of of the corporation with these uh, uh, opt outs but it is a very peculiar situation and to my knowledge I mean you don't have any other countries in in the EU having somewhat similar uh, structures or, or, or opt-outs that, that, that we do in, in Denmark. So it is a very uh, peculiar uh, situation. And, and do you see that uh, staying as it is or in the future you think uh, Danish will change their mind? Huh? I hope uh, that that will change our minds on this. But again, I'm the wrong guy to ask because <laughs> I've, I've, I've thought so ever, ever since 93 or, or, or even uh, 92. Um, I think we are being increasingly challenged by these opt-outs, uh, say on Europol, for example, where uh, one of the things that are happening in, in, in these days and times is, is that Europol, of course, is, uh, are rolling out their databases on, on, on tablets, uh, smartphones, what have you. So for the police to be able to, uh, if, if, you know, if, if, if they're chasing a car or, or whatever, they're able to instantly search in the databases, uh, which makes so much sense given that we use uh, tablets and, and mobile phones in our daily lives uh, all over the place. So it makes a lot of sense that this is also a development taking place in, in police work, in, in databases and what have you. But this is just a small example, practical example of, of where Denmark would not be able to participate. Because of this opt-out, we are not a full member of Europol. We're considered to be a third country in this. So we ha- do not have like the immediate uh, in-time access to databases. Uh, we have a, a very strange arrangement where Danish police will call officers in The Hague that would have to look up uh, stuff in these databases on behalf of Danish police rather than hang, having immediate access. So my point is just that uh, time is simply running out for these 
uh, opt-outs because uh, police in all the other Europol uh, member countries would be able to have these databases uh, on, on mobile tablets, what have you, which is a much stronger tool in order to combat crime. So, I, and I simply cannot understand, but but again, I'm the wrong guy to ask that this should be a benefit for Denmark to stay out of this. I simply do not get it. But this is where we are, and this is what we have to work with as, as of now. I think time is running out for these opt-outs, and I'd be dancing all over the streets of Copenhagen whenever mm -hmm. we might succeed in abolishing these opt-outs. Well, who knows? I mean, there, there are debates about uh, reopening the treaties uh, as part of the Conference of the Future of Europe. So, yeah. who knows? Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, speak, actually, speaking of the Conference of Future of Europe, that's perfect segue to, my, uh, to one of my final questions. Uh, if you could change anything about the EU and the way EU politics works, what would you change and why? So I, I, I think that we have too many areas where, where we require unanimity in terms of uh, foreign affairs and uh, energy taxation uh, other issues where we're home and legal affairs by the way uh, say this entire rule of law discussion uh, which is uh, in my opinion extremely serious uh, with what's going on in poland and hungary I, i see too many areas where progress in in in, in the european cooperation is being hampered by Uh, the fact of of, uh, of the, the requiring of unanimity, so I, I think that is a very sensitive discussion, and you'd have member states out there up in arms uh, if uh, or, or when we we have this discussion. But I think it's a real discussion, and and I think we need to have this discussion in order to push for Europe moving forwards and 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 reaching more effective solutions to to the problems uh, we we have. So I, I think that is an absolute. Uh, Uh, key in in this then i would like to but this is also say on on the institutional side i, I would be very much in favor of of european parliament also having the opportunity or possibility of introducing legislation mm -hmm. uh, that that not only the commission should be able to come forward with legislation but also european parliament and this has to be done in in a clever way so it's not like you know every mep coming up with his or her pet projects or what have you there should be some minimum requirements in order to ensure that it's not going totally inflationary in a in, in number of propositions or, or, or suggestions. But if we are to sort of revive or, or ensure that we have a more uh, live, say, uh, democracy in Europe, I, I think this is an important point to uh, to make also. So these are two issues that I'm, I'm looking out for, at least in, in the future debates. I just thought of that uh, when you mentioned the European Parliament. If I'm not mistaken, you used to be a member in the Danish Parliament, right? Yeah. Uh, so oh, you yeah. have now, with your experience both at national Parliament and European Parliament, uh, you know, I know it's it's hard to say, but what do you prefer <laughs> in a way? <laughs> what do you like so, more? Let's say, what do you like in uh, in, uh, in both uh, uh, national uh, or European Parliament? So I I I, um, I, I really enjoy working in European Parliament I, I uh, and and uh, coming back to this uh, climate energy issue and, and I have no doubt in my mind that that um, you know the, the the work that I have the privilege of doing in European Parliament on on, on climate and, and green issues uh, trying to push things in the right direction trying to you know negotiate with with groups or, or members from uh, all over Europe that that uh, the impact this is having, Is bigger than the impact it would have in in a national parliament. Uh, so, um, in in that regard, I'm 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 I, I sincerely think of it as a huge privilege to to serve in a European Parliament, and I, I truly believe in this agenda that Europe has to take leadership in this. So, I have no doubt. I mean, I I I much prefer working in in European Parliament. And adding to this, it is a daily pleasure. Um, As an MMP, having the opportunity to work with so many good colleagues and assistants and, and staff from all corners of, of, of Europe. Uh, so coming from a small country with five million people and then uh, working now in, in, uh, as an MEP, it's, a, it's totally different compared to national politics. And I have a, I get a kick out of it. I, I think it is such a privilege uh, to do so. I, I, I'm very happy with the. Uh, With, with being an MEP, and, and again, it, it's it's a big, big privilege. Yeah.
And uh, to, for my very uh, traditional final question of, of interviews, because I see uh, time passing, uh, what is your stance on the debate about a federal European Union? Are you in favor? Are you against? In between? Uh, so, so, uh, and, and uh, this is very much a discussion we we have in my country. Again, coming back to this issue with the opt outs and 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 uh, the Danish approach to, uh, to 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 European affairs, federal and, and federalism is is being used as a uh, a very naughty word. I'd say. Uh, I mean, this is almost the worst thing you can accuse people of in Denmark is saying that they're federalists. Uh, I don't quite get why, uh, because to to me. And, and I know this is a long discussion, uh, but but federalism, uh, in, in in my opinion, like in Germany, say, uh, implies that local authorities uh, have a high degree of autonomy. So so you you uh, I think the argument to be made is that that federalism precisely tries to ensure that the principle of subsidiarity is maintained. Um, all this to say that. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't care much for, be it federalism or, or, or some other of, of, of these big and, and sophisticated words. I, I see some, some very important areas where Europe would need to further strengthen the cooperation, not least in the green and issues and climate issues, but but also in terms of combating uh, crime or, or, uh, or say migration and, and and addressing these issues. There we need stronger cooperation now that is not necessarily uh, federalism as such but but mm -hmm. i know this is a, a big and open debate but i see some very important areas where we have to strengthen cooperation further in the future if we are to address the issues that i think that the citizens of of, of denmark and other european countries rightfully expect from us to uh, to solve so I know it doesn't fully answer your, your question. So uh, oh, I know that's very, that's very clear. That, that I acknowledge fully that, that member states have and, and should have a, a key and vital say in, 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 in all this. Uh, and, and, and we have to acknowledge this also uh, when working in Brussels and not trying to have big illusions of, you know, big schemes that you can impose on member states and uh, what have you. I mean, we, we have to be able to work these things out uh, together, but but I, I'm also very pragmatic and practical in my approach to politics. Things have to work. I see problems out there that we all have to solve together, and this requires stronger collaboration in a number of areas. All right, no, that was that was pretty clear and interesting uh, uh, as an explanation. So it's been an hour. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for for coming with us. Before uh, I let you go, uh, I would let you. Uh, tell uh, the audience a final word so the floor is yours to tell them uh, whatever you would like thank you so much and and, and thank you again for for inviting me I, I i enjoyed this and and i think initiatives like this are, are very important in order to cast further light on, on on what it is that we try to do as as members of of, of european parliament um i, I think it's a great privilege uh, serving in in european parliament i think we have real issues on 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 climate and green transition, for example, that are are, are so important, and, and the only way to address these issues is is by working stronger together. And this is what I wake up and try to do uh, every morning in, in in European Parliament. Well, that's very good to to hear someone passionate about what he does, uh, and that's what that's why I do that as well. Uh, so again, uh, chat, uh, make sure to uh, to thank Mr. Peterson, Mr. Peterson, uh, Peterson. Thank you a lot again for for coming with us tonight. Uh, chat, don't forget to follow him on his Twitter account. You can see it below the video field and then from there you can access uh, probably his Facebook and uh, whatever else he has in terms of social media. Uh, so we will start uh, the, the, the debriefing. Mr. Peterson, thanks again and I wish you a good evening and maybe uh, see you next time. Thank you so much. My Have a pleasure. good evening. Thank you so much. Have a good Bye -bye. evening. Bye. All right, guys. Uh, let me put my thing aside. Zoom, I don't need that anymore all right uh actually I, I i hope you didn't notice it i'm sure you noticed it uh, i realized like 45 minutes 45 minutes in the uh, uh in the interview that uh the the under the, the under the the video for you saying danish since 2014 no it was danish mep it didn't become danish in in 2014 so uh, i made a little boo boo i i fixed it in between but well uh that's my, that's on me so uh what did you think uh of the interview i, I think i thought it was Quite interesting it was actually 
very good at uh, uh, explaining things on very complicated complicated issue, especially on on energy because it's far from being a uh, an easy issue. Uh, but he was very clear on, on that, and uh, uh, he was quick in uh, relatively quick in his answer. So I, I didn't have to cut uh, that many questions compared to what I had. Um, yeah, Danish in 2014. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh, I fixed that uh, midstream, but well, uh, that when I realized that, I was like, oops. Uh, but anyway, uh, I have my. Uh, you didn't see, okay. So maybe I screwed myself by uh, by by mentioning it. Um, okay, so let me take my notes and we'll go through uh, what I have uh, there to see if I can uh, give anything new. Uh, you mentioned something uh, at the beginning to say that. Uh, climate change was uh, an eye-opener for me like when he started to, uh, to to discover the issues in 2014 when he started to work on on that for him it, it was a, a, an eye-opener and it's it's interesting because it's uh it's quite revealing of the of the political trends that have evolved uh, evolved in europe i mean in in beyond that uh, beyond uh, beyond european politics even national politics i'm sure you will have noticed that like if you were back 20 20 years ago 25 years ago 30 years ago even beyond talking about climate change about green policies you were it was like the most niche kind of a, a kind of a topic ever nobody would uh, would talk about these topics apart from the greens uh that were yeah exactly like you guys saying it was ep politics um and across uh, across the like past 20 years uh, in the course of the past 20 years we've seen uh, the the topic rise more and more and more first it rose it rose on the on the left side of politics and now even on the right side, uh, on the on the right side of politics, so you you go to the EPP, they acknowledge very well that yeah, climate change is going to be an uh, environmental policy is going to be the big, uh, the big political debate of the coming years, and we have to be committed to that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's quite interesting to see uh, as a uh, the, the change of politics. Uh, you're not that old. Oh shit, I'm uh, I'm the I'm the grandpa here. Well, I I can tell you that back in my days. People were not talking about green policies, I can tell you that. Um, let's see. People don't think something is important until it affects them. Yeah, exactly. That, uh, that's uh, exactly that. Uh, but yeah, it, it's uh, quite interesting to see A, the topic rise as a, as a political issue in general, and then see how the, 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 the different political groups are assimilating the issue and making them part of their uh, of their agenda. I mean, when you hear the PP talking about environmental policy, uh, they didn't copy paste the program of the Greens. Uh, they, they have their own take on it. Uh, even if they said they all say now, well, environmental policy is an important thing. We have to fight against climate change, but they, they give it its own spin and they, they make it fit into the, the, the general political narrative. But it's, it's quite interesting to see how you, you see uh, uh, these things evolve and sometimes how uh, unlikely, MEP, uh, unlikely MEPs are the ones pushing the issue forward. So, like, like for for instance, I remember back in the uh, back when I was in Parliament, uh, uh, one of the very vocal MEP in terms of environment, of health policy, etc., was a was a German EPP, not a, not a, not a Green, uh, and it was very much uh, pushing on that. Uh, please get an uh, IDT and Democracy member next time for an interview. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, no, it's a, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to segue into the discussion because it would warrant a long discussion that, that maybe we'll have one day. Uh, but so far, I've always I've decided not to invite them uh, because of the of the of the, of the stage of uh, uh, because I, I felt it was too early in the in the, in the lifetime of the of the channel. I wanted to build on the on the build solid bases before uh, getting them in. But I, I don't exclude having them uh, at some point in the future. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, going back on track. Uh, what else did we talk to? Uh, we talked about the, the, the taxonomy. So uh, those of you who followed my uh, my news review probably know a bit about that. The taxonomy is this uh, kind of EU label that uh, that is given to to green energy or energies that are to good for tra the energy transition. Uh, and the idea there is to in a way, incentivize member to guide member states and investors towards the energies that will help fight against climate change. So, of course, there's a renewable, but then there's the entire debate about uh, gas and nuclear energy. And you had two different coalitions pushing for uh, for their inclusion in there. And it seems likely that they will be recognized as such by the Commission as part of a single package. So, it, 
unless something goes awry, and again, it's poetic, so everything is possible, it's likely that uh, nuclear and gas will be recognized as part of the green taxonomy. So consider not green energy, but energies that can be used for, for, for transition. Uh, and he mentioned himself that it's a question of, uh, of, uh, of pragmatism. Uh, Gilbert Collard on the channel. Well, who knows? Who knows? Uh, maybe next year. Um, depending on what I want to do next year, I, the, the, that might not be out of the... Uh, uh, Impossible to envisage, but we'll see. We'll see next year uh, how things evolve. First, uh, I have to consolidate my base. Um, what else did we talk about? Oh, we talked a lot about uh, uh, Russian gas, uh, China, China uh, on different things, uh, whether it's in energy and generally on uh, uh, speaking on uh, on environmental policy. So, of course, there's this big problem of the uh, of the Russian uh, dependency. Uh, well, us depending on the on the, on Russia. Uh, in the, uh, for for uh, provision uh, for for getting gas, uh, it's too bad I forgot to do it before the stream. I had found like uh, last weekend a, a nice graphic that was showing the different uh, uh, sources for the EU uh, for, for the supply sources for for gas. Uh, I don't have it there. Uh, that's on me. Uh, apologies. It was, it was quite interesting because basically it's a uh, the gas come from uh, Russia, then Algeria, and then it breaks down into more uh, more countries. Uh, uh, from around the world uh, and then uh, I asked the question also about China because one of the uh, one of the thing uh, that is already the case huh, but uh, we're not talking that much about it is that we have and actually the world has a dependency on China when it comes to what is called uh, rare minerals uh, rare earth mineral which is uh, very like the name implies rare minerals that are actually essentials to build uh, stuff like batteries or even some uh, uh, microchips and that, that sort of thing and as it happens uh, most of the world's reserve of uh, of rare minerals are located in China uh, do I mean West, West Taiwan uh, yes I mean I mean West China uh, Taiwan I mean. and technically Taiwan uh, is the Republic uh, the Republic of China uh, so anyway before we uh, we uh, go into the uh, uh, the official appellation of, uh, of uh, each country and regions. Uh, we already have a dependency on uh, rocking your identism in your chat, finally. <laughs> Why do you say that that's something you like, that's like an, uh, an achievement, Icaros? <laughs> um, so yeah, the Ch China uh, and the uh, rare minerals is a, is a big issue uh, because they have their uh, almost monopole. I think the, the other main supply, I think is is in Australia, and uh, I don't want to say something stupid, but I think so. there's one country uh, in Central Africa that is uh, that uh, that has also some uh, good supplies there. Uh, Alex, do you want to ask him a question about how you got into position uh, of MP assistant, study, or something else? Uh, I could I actually I made a I made a stream about that. Uh, you could find it on my YouTube channel uh, when I I talked about the the. Uh, the job of MEP assistant, I, I came on uh, on how I, I got to, to it, but basically I, I always say I got there by uh, a bit by luck. Uh, I, as part of my studies, I went there to make an internship. Uh, I got my internship in the parliament and I stayed ever since. Um, so yeah, I, I'm and uh, yeah, I, I got it uh, through uh, through my studies. Yeah, in a, in a, to an extent, I was doing European studies, so. Uh, I didn't get the job because I'm uh, an activist or, or whatever in a political party. I, uh, I was what we called more of a, of a technical assistant. Uh, so, uh, going back on track, what else did we talk about? Uh, I have something that he didn't uh, wanted any top-down uh, top solutions on energy and rather something that is uh, uh, decentralized, that each member state should decide on what is good for, uh, for them. Uh, and that's also valid for climate change. Uh, Dutch public policy students dream to work at the EU. Well, then uh, the, the one advice I can give you is try to get an internship in the bubble. That's the, the one thing you, uh, you you can do. Once you get the internship, at least you haven't fit in there and you, you will learn uh, how it actually works uh, down in the trenches. And that's how, that's how it works. So my, my one big advice would be to find, a, find an internship in the bubble. Uh, and then work your way uh, fr from there. 
Um, um, so, oh yeah, he talked about the, the idea of, uh, of pulling uh, energy sources. So he says, oh yeah, the EU should, uh, uh, a member state should, should pull together, should buy together energy, uh, energy sources, so, uh, in, a, in a way to, to as a way to, to uh, create this European market. And that here is a bit reminiscent to a current debate that was pushed by Spain uh, in the context of the, of the energy crisis, so the increase of, of the price of, of gas, because we have uh, Spain along now with a number of... Uh, uh, along with a number of uh, other member states, they are pushing for the idea of a bit reproducing what the EU did for vaccines. Uh, which is to create, so the EU would buy, in the name of the entire EU, uh, natural gas, and with that, they would create a strategic reserve. Uh, strategic reserve, what, he, what is it? Uh, it's something. It's a concept that was created in the 70s after the after the the, the first uh, the first couple uh, increase in the in the price of oil. Uh, the idea was for members, so for countries around the world. To create these strategic reserves, so they buy oil, they stockpile it, and basically they use that uh, that reserve when prices are getting high or where there is a crisis as a way to uh, smooth uh, things for their own economy, so that they don't they they don't get shortages of uh, of, of oil. So usually, the, you consider that uh, the, the strategic reserve uh, must represent about four worth uh, forty days of national consumption uh, of oil. So. The idea here pushed by Spain would be to do something similar at EU level, but for gas, natural gas, as a way to counter the situation where they would have a huge increase in prices uh, of natural gas, like, as we've seen uh, over the past few uh, weeks and months, actually. Um, what else do I have? Ah, he made a, quite a, uh, an interesting answer about nuclear energy when he said, oh, well, I'm not against nuclear energy, but I'm waiting for someone to show me uh, affordable, well, not affordable, but uh, economically sound nuclear project. And he made a reference to uh, what in French we call the EPR, so the current, uh, uh, I always forget, it's the fourth or fifth generation uh, uh, nuclear uh, reactors, but it's these, uh, the, these uh, new French reactors that are being built uh, in France, but also he made reference to the UK and also to fin uh, it's Finland, I think, uh, which is bu uh, building one. And these uh, new re uh, these new reactors were conceived uh, a bit after uh, the 9/11 attack, so in 2001, and they were built as to be like super secure uh, kind of facilities. Uh, except that the problem is that a they are super expensive, of course, and whenever they've been trying to to build them, it there has been it has been costing like. A shit ton of money, more money than uh, than it was uh, anticipated. Like I, I want to say double the price, but I'm not even sure it's that. And there has been huge delays. So yeah, the, the uh, this new this current generation of nuclear uh, reactor is quite controversial because it's it, it's not working well in terms of infrastructure. Uh, there's been a lot of problems. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's putting a dent a bit in the uh, in the credential of uh, nuclear energy. Uh, uh, even if I mean for a country like France, uh, it's not really avoidable i mean 70 percent of the french energy electricity is produced with nuclear uh so they, they we're not gonna get rid of nuclear energy uh, anytime soon soon and then there's debate debate on whether we should even get rid of nuclear uh, to begin with but that's another uh long discussion uh what else do i have on my uh on my little notebook um china and climate change uh yeah so in short we uh china did not did not show up uh, at the COP26 uh, and did not make any new commitments in terms of uh, in terms of emission reduction because, like uh, like you mentioned, uh, China represents a quarter of the uh, of the world emission on, on its own. Uh, but and they also have like already big big problems with uh, with uh, not climate change but with, but with pollution because they have levels of uh, of uh, air pollution that are just insane. Like nothing. You will never see in Europe something equivalent to what they have in China. It's it's quite insane what the, where they are. I, I remember uh, Norway is ninety eight percent renewable energy. Uh, huh. On the uh, Norway is ninety eight percent renewable. I mean, you, uh, Norway has oil, so the, maybe they were probably they're exporting it. 
Uh, but to be fair, it's true that you do have, you do have geothermal. There is geothermal energy in uh, in Norway, but okay, ninety eight percent. That's that's surprising. Um, what was I speaking of? Oh yeah, China and and uh, and uh, air pollutions. I remember when there were the the the, the uh, Olympic Games in in China in Beijing. Uh, what they did the a few weeks uh, a few weeks before uh, the the beginning of the game, the the opening ceremony of the game. Uh, to get rid of the smog that was constantly above Beijing and so that it could do uh, fireworks, etc., that it would look nice on camera, uh, they sprayed in the atmosphere a fuck ton of, uh, of chemicals that would basically to dissolve temporarily the, the smog that was constantly above, uh, uh, above Beijing so that for the, for the opening ceremony you would have a, a clear sky uh, and very nice image uh, on camera. But... To an extent, I don't know if I, I don't remember what they put in the atmosphere to to dissolve this kind of uh, of, of smog, but I, I don't think it was very good uh, for for the uh, uh, for health. Uh, I mean, it's to the point where there is uh, in China uh, there is the official the official like uh, measurement of the of air pollution, and then there is, which is let's say polished to uh, to. Uh, make it more palatable to, to, to the needs of the government. And then you have the unofficial air pollution measurements that, that are done actually by, uh, notably by uh, embassies, foreign embassies, Western embassies. Uh, and uh, China has been, uh, the Chinese government has been like uh, uh, doing stuff for, uh, like, like, like to, to, to push back against the, these measures. And they even, I think uh, at some point they were, they were trying to, to, uh, to prevent them from happening, but uh, yeah, it, air pollution is a big, big topic in uh, in, in China, uh, along with coal, of course, because uh, China relies a lot on coal to, to produce its energy. Uh, I'm gonna move on fast because I see time passing. Uh, what do I have uh, that is interesting to talk about? Uh, Eurasian Europe, so the research program that he said was the uh, a bit like the Erasmus of research, which is true. Eurasian Europe is a is a discreet but quite successful program uh, in the, in the field of research, uh, and it goes well beyond the EU. Actually, it's a, I mean it's like Erasmus. Uh, you have ton of uh, of third countries that are part of Eurasian Europe. Uh, he said it was okay for according to him to to leverage politically uh, the uh, Horizon Europe uh, with other political uh, concerns, like for instance to. To stop the UK from, uh, or at least to slow down the UK from uh, uh, entering the Eurozone Europe program because of the Brexit, uh, Brexit thing. Uh, it was a fun, blunt position. I mean, yeah, I, I was not expecting that, to be honest. Uh, you sent me a video on Discord. Okay, thanks. Um, it was a fun, but it was a blunt position. I was not expecting that, to be honest. Uh, I was expecting that. We said, oh no, it's, a, it's research is for everyone, but it, it was a. Uh, it was blunt and realistic, I, I would say. I mean, that's uh, that's real politic uh, uh, there. So Eurasian Europe is uh, one of the jewels. So why should should you give up the jewel uh, to a country that doesn't want to play ball on other politics? Uh, so that's a uh, that's fair game, to, uh, so, so to say. Uh, he did mention that the EU was too naive with China. That's a that's a big tendency that we uh, that we see the, over the past few years, uh, and that is playing also in the. Uh, in the EU and US relationship, because the uh, US is very much in favor of being more aggressive or at least more strong towards China, and the US being a bit uh, slower or less gang -o on that, because there are a number of countries that have deep tie economic ties with uh, uh, with China, Germany, for instance, even if it's it's changing a little bit, uh, or Eastern countries uh, like Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, or uh, Assertive. Okay, that's that's the official uh, uh, that's the official uh, language. So assertive politics. Okay, I'm going to stick with aggressive because uh, it's easier to say than assertive. Uh, anyway, uh, and I'm not bound by the uh, by the Borel lingo, so to say. Uh, what else do I have to tell you? Interest that is interesting. Uh, on Turkey, I, at first he surprised me when he said, "Oh yeah, well, I don't think Turkey is in a good place to enter the EU." Uh, because I thought he was saying, oh yeah, they should not be, Turkey should not enter at all in the EU, but then he, he clarified that by saying, no, no, Turkey could have a place in the EU, but not under Erdogan. Uh, but, I mean, really, uh, realistically speaking, uh, I don't see any time soon or ever uh, Turkey joining the EU. I mean, 
there would be at least a veto from France and, uh, and a few other countries, so I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. But well, in, in any case, the, Erdogan provides a, 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 nice, a nice excuse to uh, uh, not push forward with that. Uh, ah, yeah, so I talked a bit about the, the, the Denmark Supreme Court in comparison to, to, to Poland. So, like I mentioned, uh, I, I discovered that actually it was a question from uh, from Reddit that I received about that, and I, I double checked because I wasn't sure, and, I, and it turns out it was it was true. There is a, there was indeed a, a a ruling, a decision from the Danish Supreme, Supreme Court that said that uh, in some cases uh, the constitution was super, the national constitution was superior to EU law. Uh, Oh, that's very. So I, I read a bit about that. It's very specific to uh, the Danish constitutional uh, system and the Danish constitutional court because it only it doesn't recognize uh, unre unwritten principles of EU law, uh, and it it says that the uh, the EU uh, competence only extend as far as the competences are openly transferred uh, from the member state to. Uh, to to uh, to the EU. Uh, that being said, why am I mentioning this? Uh, it's because yes, there is a there is this Danish ruling uh, about the rule of law in saying that it's not absolute. In some cases, the national constitution and national law can be superior, but it's very very limited, and it's nowhere. It's not comparable in any way, shape, or form with uh, with what Poland did because uh, uh, Poland call into question the, the, the written principle, the, 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 the treaties themselves. So he went way, 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 way further than, uh, than what the Denmark uh, ever did. And himself, he said that, well, no, it, rule of law and, uh, and the primacy of EU law is essential, uh, especially for a small country like Denmark, etc., etc. So, oh, yeah, first page of the treaties, nonetheless. Yeah, uh, the, Poland was not exactly uh, solo in that one. Uh, he discussed a bit about, about the, the opt-outs uh, and... He was not a, a regular Dane, uh, Danish person in, in this sense because he, he disagrees with the uh, with the uh, with the current opt-outs. Uh, but he doesn't see that uh, changing uh, anytime soon. So we'll we'll see how the, how things work. And I he wasn't sure about about that. And I'm not sure either anymore. Uh, I the question is, are uh, is there other EU countries that have? opt-outs uh since the uk left i think that the only country apart from uh yeah ireland has defense okay ireland i wasn't sure and i think sweden has de facto uh uh an opt-out because although i, I don't i think it's Petrusita who, who mentioned it in chat uh they have an opt-out but it's debatable whether it's a legal opt-out because uh Denmark does not have the euro and actually negotiated to clearly be excluded from the get-go from getting the euro. So they have the official opt-out. But uh, on the other end, Sweden uh, made a referendum to refuse the euro. And to an extent, there is an argument that actually Sweden broke the treaties in the sense that when they joined... Uh, in, in the EU in uh, 95 uh, they didn't negotiate an opt-out and in the treaties it always says that uh, unless you have an opt-out you are uh, you you are bound to join the euro at some point it's not it doesn't have to be on the date of the of the when you join the EU but at some point you are bound to join the euro it's it's the in a way it's a long-term perspective uh, and Sweden signed that. And by doing a referendum afterwards to reject the euro, uh, in a way, there is a debate of whether, or in a small debate, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not anything, uh, nobody's going to sue, uh, sue the Sweden about that, and nobody's going to sue Sweden about that. There's a debate on whether it was even legal for them to, uh, to do that. Uh, to do this, uh, this referendum to, to create, de uh, create uh, de facto an opt-out for themselves. Uh, and I think I, I think I have a fun fact on, on that. Uh, Petrus has a fun fact. Polish armed force of German leopards. They bought around 30 American Abrams, and they want to buy Merkavas from Israel. Oh, if anything, they are they are definitely not relying on a on a single source of uh, of 
to supply their army. And I, I think I read on Twitter at some point that they were planning to renew again and to buy more material uh, on that front. Uh, but yeah, I, actually speaking of, of Poland and, uh, and defense, uh, I don't. I, I think I have it as a, as a quote, but uh, uh, back then, when uh, soon after Poland joined the EU, uh, so in 2004, I think in 2005, uh, they bought uh, planes. They were biting, uh, biting. They were buying uh, uh, fighters, and France uh, was pushing to uh, for Poland to, to buy uh, uh, French Rafale. And in the end, uh, uh, Poland bought uh, Poland bought uh, American. Uh, material and they justify themselves in saying oh well we don't we are not bound to to uh we're not bound to 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 buy european we are we we uh, buying us is uh, is good etc etc uh and the fun fact the fun fact is that uh, uh for after that the french president of the time jacques chirac said uh, that uh, uh that poland missed an opportunity to shut up <laughs> when they said that uh, so it, it remained uh one of the one of his main quotes huh? Uh, are you juice on Discord? Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, did I miss something in chat? No, I don't think I did. Uh, what else do I have? Uh, and besides that, uh, yeah, the debate about federal European Union. So he's not a federalist, but he's in favor of EU integration. So the idea that there could be and there should be more EU. Uh, oh, hey, thanks, Icaros, for, the, for all the gifts. Uh, so yeah, the idea that there should be... Uh, more EU integration, more EU competence, but that does not mean uh, that they should be a, a federal Europe. Uh, ah, you thought that... Uh, no, it's, it's not me that... Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, my nickname is not Juice. <laughs> it's not that. Uh, I think you should use both F F F-16 and Euro Typhons. Uh, I don't think you met friends with friends, we are with friends either, yeah, because Euro Typhon is, uh, is actually uh, not... Uh, French supported system. I think it's. Uh, I don't remember what other countries are part of the of the Euro Typhoon. I know there's the UK, Italy. Uh, I wonder if there's not Germany in there somewhere. Um, but anyway, uh, let's move on from this. And actually, that was my last topic. And it's nine thirty, so you know I'm. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, so I hope that you enjoyed uh, the interview and the discussion. I bit. Uh, I went a bit all over the place. Uh, doing the debriefing sorry about that uh it happens um next time uh it's gonna be on sunday for the news review at six in french and at eight uh in english uh next week we're gonna have two interviews uh one with uh, uh not a swedish uh a dutch green mep uh and another one with an ecr uh member actually so it's gonna be the first ecr we have on the on the, on the channel uh so it's gonna be quite uh interesting so i hope i will see you on sunday and if not uh, next week in the meantime i wish you a good evening and i will see you uh next time bye guys have a good one and oh yeah of course uh, as always don't forget to follow me uh here uh on twitch and on my other social media posting the link uh you just have to click and then you know where, what to do so have a good one guys bye